that December 28th will not only be the anniversary for Carl and Donna, but it was also the 46th anniversary for Pastor Tim and Jen. Is that correct? It was 
unhealthy, it was nasty, it was draining my bank account. I had to quit. So I went around and I announced to everybody, I'm going to quit smoking. I am a non-smoker. I'm going to quit. I quit smoking. You know, I go around to my friends, I quit smoking. It's nasty. It's gross. I quit smoking. And I was so focused on the task of quitting smoking and being a non-smoker. I was so focused on that. But then I would go around my friends and they would smoke and I would smell it and I'd go, well, I'll just, I'll just have and I would smoke one, and then I would feel so defeated because my goal of being a non-smoker, this focus that I had, it went out the window, you know? And so I would, I would go and I'd buy a pack and I'd say, oh, 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 I failed anyway. I failed, I might as well just give up. But then I would smoke again and I would feel disgusting and nasty and broke. <laughs> and I would say, no, I have to quit smoking. So on and on, this would go to finally, I had this revelation. I am a smoker. It's too late. I crossed the line. I, I've crossed that line, and, and I'm now a smoker. It's, it's the same philosophy in Alcoholics Anonymous. You want your alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. I have crossed the line. I made the choice in my life, and I became a smoker. Now, I did not share this philosophy with my life insurance company, so please, if you work in Transamerica, do not take this back to headquarters. But instead, what it did was it, it was a philosophy or a mindset that helped change my perspective on this. Because there is a law of health in place here. Smoking is bad for your health. There is just a simple physiological law. Smoking is bad for your health. I don't think anybody, even a smoker, would dispute that. Smoking is bad for your health. That is just the law of good health. I was so determined to live by that law of making myself a non-smoker that I became so captive to the law. By, by that one thing that I was fighting so hard to just be a non-smoker. And then when I, I failed, I, I would, I would you know, give up and I would start smoking again. But when I finally made this realization, I'm a smoker. Like, I, I've already broken this law of good health. It, it shifted my focus. That instead of solely being narrowly minded to, to quit smoking and be a non-smoker, I looked ahead and I wanted better health. The, the law of smoking gives you bad health. The intention behind that is to have better health. So understanding where I was and knowing where I wanted to be helped me to break free from the captivity of that law to move forward to the intent of the law. Strict adherence and narrow focus on the laws without a deep understanding of the intent of the law is legalism. And legalism is solely about keeping the law and misses the point of its intent. And this is not too different from how we should understand the law of the Lord and our sin nature. The law of the Lord is that we live holy and righteous lives in the eyes of the Lord. When we look back in the Old Testament, we see over and over again how his people would get so caught up in the personal fulfillment of the law to the point where it drove them further from God and deeper into sin. In the New Testament, Jesus is constantly speaking against the Pharisees. It's not about what you can do to fulfill the law or to live a sinless life. You are a sinner. We are all sinners. And until we understand that and realize that it's only by the grace of God that we're saved from our sins, we will die in our sins. So why then does Luke tell us this story about how Jesus' parents fulfilled all the Jewish laws? Why, if only by the grace of God we're saved, would we even need to know this or even care about these laws? In 
Matthew 5.17, Jesus says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law is the law. Just as smoking is harmful to your health and could kill you, sin is harmful to your spiritual health and will kill you. With the gift of grace and mercy by the sacrifice of Jesus, we sometimes forget that. We think we're free to live how we want to live because Jesus died for us. All I have to do is ask for forgiveness. That reflects a heart that does not truly know Christ. We are still called to live a life of holiness and righteousness in the eyes of God. But we have been given Jesus Christ to fulfill the law so that through him we might be saved from the consequences of our sin. You cannot be righteous on your own. You cannot be righteous on your own. Your personal pursuits of righteousness and adherence to the law will imprison you. When you acknowledge that you are a sinner and that only by God's grace you are saved, you can pick yourself up and move forward Jesus died for our sins and became our picture of perfect health. So that our focus is not on a strict adherence to the law, but on the righteousness and holiness of Christ. And by this, you can find freedom in the law of the Lord. This passage of scripture is really broad and there's a lot in here. And I could probably spend two or three hours breaking it down. Should, should we, you know, I don't think you guys want to stay here. I, I talk long enough as it is, right? But today, let, let's try and see some of the parallels that are going on here. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the chapter two. And we'll start off with verse 22 as Pastor Tim has read for us. So as we go through the scriptures, let's try to see what pearls of wisdom there are regarding the understanding of the law of the Lord and the freedom that we have. So verse 22 says, And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought, up, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present it to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So if you look back at verse 21, this is the Jewish law. This is the law that they're talking about, that Joseph and Mary were following. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. The law of Jewish custom says that after the seventh day, the eighth day, a child should be circumcised. And then 33 days after that, he's to be purified. Along with that, Mary, the mother, needed to be purified after the 39th day after giving birth. So on the 40th day, basically, uh, the child and the mother both had to go to the temple for their purification. And it says they includes Joseph. It's only to assume that because Joseph was in their presence and, and probably helping out, he himself needed to be cleansed and purified uh, because of his contact with them. The interesting thing about this section of the scripture, though, is that it says, according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves were two young pigeons. Well, if you go back to Leviticus, according to the law, they're supposed to bring a young lamb and a bird. That was the first command of the law. When you come for purification, a lamb and a bird. But it says if you cannot afford a lamb, you can bring a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So what does it say? Well, definitely we know that Jesus came from humble beginnings. But what does it tell us about the law? This is what I see here. It reflects to me, this reflects to me is the focus again of the law. What matters is 
the end result of obedience to the one who makes the law. Freedom in the law of the Lord comes with simple obedience to the Lord. It's not how extravagant your holiness is or how glowing your righteousness is. Simple obedience to the one who gives the law gives us the grace for forgiveness and the freedom to live toward holiness. Consider Matthew chapter 6. Jesus gives a couple of examples there. He talks about giving to the poor. Don't go ahead and blow the trumpets and let everybody know that you're giving to the poor. In fact, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Then he talks about prayer. And he says, don't be like the hypocrites and pray on the street corners so that everybody can hear you. Go in your own room and close your door. And then he talks about fasting. When you're fasting, don't look somber and weak so that people know that you're fasting. <clears throat> what is he saying here? Is he saying we need to do everything in secret? I mean, if that's the case, then we shouldn't have prayer in church, right? No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the hypocrites, the intent of what you are doing. When you start to do these things, it becomes about the law, and it becomes about how righteous I am, and how holy I am. Listen to my long-winded prayer. Look at how much I'm giving to the poor. And Jesus is speaking against that. It's not how extravagant your holiness is, or how glowing your righteousness is. Simple obedience to the one who gives it all, it gives us the grace for forgiveness and the freedom to live for holiness. Verse 25, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child of Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God. Simeon is somebody we don't know too much about. Whatever we read here, that's pretty much what we know about Simeon. He doesn't even have a formal title. Luke doesn't tell us if he's a prophet or a priest or what. All we know is that he's been given this word for that he would not see death until he sees the Lord's Christ. We do know that he was righteous and devout, which to me would lead me to make the assumption that Simeon lived in obedience to the law. Here's the biggest affirmation for me on this. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Have you ever met somebody that you felt, man, the Holy Spirit is upon them. Have you ever met anybody like that? Where you felt, man, they are so filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and when, when you think about that person that you met, it, is it somebody that seems to lean on the side of righteousness or unrighteousness? It's when we're under the law of God, which is His righteousness, that we open ourselves up to receiving the Holy Spirit. We open ourselves up to receiving the Holy Spirit. I know for myself, when I am not right with God, I just feel so empty with God. I don't know if you guys experience that too. But whenever I, I, I just get so caught up in life, and I get so caught up in, in activity and details, and, and I don't know, the kids are yelling, and I just, you know, clean the house, and, you know, I, I, I lose myself, and I lose sight of God, and I feel so empty of Him. But when we live in the freedom of the law of the Lord, we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. <clears throat> the other thing that I want to point out here is verse 27. I believe that the Holy Spirit and the law of the Lord work together for His glory and His good. 
They work together for his glory and his good. Verse 27 says, And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry him in the custom of the law. So here you have Simeon coming by the Holy Spirit to the temple. And on the other side, here you have Mary and Joseph coming to fulfill the law of the Lord. And they come together, the working of the Holy Spirit and the law of the Lord, to fulfill prophecy and to glorify God, the Savior born unto us. When you live in the freedom of the law of the Lord, you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Verse 40. Then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. And his father and mother were amazed at these things, which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this Christ is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What I see here in this passage is a plain and simple declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the salvation for all peoples. For the Gentiles, he is a light of revelation. For the Israel, for Israel, he is glory. This man Simeon was promised that he would not see death until he saw the Savior of the world. The reality is that most of us have not received that same promise. Friends, Jesus is Savior. Jesus is life. Jesus is hope. Only in a life that is devoted to following Him, repentant of sin, under His law, pursuing His righteousness, will we know the Savior. Do not let death rob you of that knowledge and gift of eternal salvation and spiritual wholeness in Christ. Know Him today and follow Him the rest of your life into eternity. Allow Him to be the revelation to you who do not know Him and the glory to you who do. Verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayer. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God, continued to speak to him, of him, to all those who were looking for him, for redemption of Jerusalem. Here we have another person now that we can assume lived under the law of the Lord. Her example of piety expressed by her dedication to service in the temple with fasting and prayer. As a prophetess, she was no doubt also in anticipation of the Savior. Out of her fasting and prayer, she looked over at Simeon giving this blessing, and she begins to give thanks to God. She recognized the Savior. When we live freely under the law of the Lord, we see clearly the Savior in our lives. Not only that, but she begins to tell others. And so again, when we live freely under the law of the Lord, we can't help but share the good news with everyone. <clears throat> Finally, verse 39. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So there's something interesting about this section of Luke, uh, this, this whole passage, the entire passage we went over today is we consider his audience, right? So the intent of this gospel is, is probably multicultural. It's not just for a Jewish audience. It's, it's for all people. But he addresses it specifically to one person, Theophilus. It's 
pretty safe to assume and most likely that Theopolis was an actual person, in fact was a, a Roman official. So why, if he's writing this to a Roman official, would he talk so much about Jewish tradition? It's because the law of the Lord is not abolished. The law of the Lord remains. So what exactly is the law of the Lord? Look, you look at the first five books of the Bible, right? Uh, people call it the Torah. The, the Jewish tradition calls it the Torah. These five, first five books of the Bible, there is 613 commandments. 613 commandments. And some would make this argument, in fact, I've heard some Jewish scholars say this, that the Ten Commandments is actually ten categories where all of these 613 commandments can fit under. So if you look at the Ten Commandments that are given, all of these 613 commandments that are given in the first five books would fall under one of these categories. <clears throat> Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. And, and, and hear how he answers this lawyer in Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a the lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law, and the prophets. These, Jesus says, are the greatest commandments. Just as the Ten Commandments categorize the 613 commandments in the Torah, I've heard it suggested that these two commandments could actually summarize the Ten Commandments. So here we have 613, and now Jesus is boiling it down to two. He's like, man, you guys are screwing it up over here. How about I make it a little more simple for you guys? Love God, love others. Jesus boiled it down so that we can focus on the intent of the law, which is righteousness in the eyes of God. And live freely under it and not bound by the legalism of these laws. The law of the Lord is still valid today. If you believe this is the inspired word of God, what do you do with the Old Testament? Are we supposed to just read the New Testament? If this is the inspired word of God, then everything in here is true. The law of the Lord is still valid today. Read your scriptures, you seek the Holy Spirit's direction, and the law is apparent. The law is this. A life of sin is apart from righteousness. When you are absent of righteousness, you are subject to the death, to death by sin. Sin equals death, righteousness equals life. These commands we are are so we might pursue a life of righteousness in the eyes of God. This cannot be done in our own efforts. When we, on our own, try to obtain righteousness, we become prisoners to legalism and rigidity. When we submit our obedience to the one who gives the law, we have life and freedom in the law of the Lord. Freedom in the law of the Lord comes with simple obedience to the one who gives it. When we find that freedom under the law of the Lord, we open ourselves up to the working of the Holy Spirit. When we are able to do that, we can clearly see the Savior in our lives, and we cannot help but share it with others. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you First of all, for the law that you have given us, so that we might pursue a life that is righteous in your eyes. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who came to fulfill that law, because on our own we cannot, we cannot fulfill that law. We cannot obtain righteousness, but through Jesus Christ, we can. And so, Lord, we thank you for that gift. But may we not take it lightly in our pursuit of becoming more like Christ, righteous in your eyes. We receive the grace and mercy and press forward to a life of